Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to what is uh, promising to be a very insightful session on probably one of the most pertinent, imminent uh, geopolitical challenges of our times of the 21st century. Of course, I am talking about Afghanistan, uh, where events have unfolded rather quickly in previous uh, weeks. Uh, and many lessons to be drawn from the situation in Afghanistan. Therefore, I could not have asked for a more knowledgeable uh, panel to be assembled here on stage today in Abu Dhabi to talk about uh, the present, but also the future of Afghanistan. Delighted to have us uh, with us the director of the Department of International Security Corporation at the UAE Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Salem Mohammed Al Zabi. Welcome to you, uh, sir. Uh, lovely to have uh, CNN senior European correspondent based in Paris, Jim Bitterman, of course, a very famous fixture whom many of you are familiar with. Uh, I'm extremely delighted to welcome the senior reporter and war correspondent at Le Figaro, Renaud Girard, who knows Afghanistan probably as well as anyone here uh, in this room. We have the director of research and communications at IFRI, Mark Ecker, who has written a very comprehensive book about the war on terror, where Afghanistan, of course, is prominently Featured also with us is the head of at the Russia NIS Center of Ifri Tatiana Kastueva John, and last but certainly not least, I'm delighted to welcome back on stage M. K. Narayanan, who is of course a former senior advisor and national security advisor to the Prime Minister of India, and currently the chairman of Securex system. So much to talk about in uh, these uh, 80 minutes uh, that we have, uh, uh, Mr. Salem, Mr. al -Zabi. To, to kick us off, uh, Afghanistan is a region of importance, is a region of importance to the West, but also here in this region, quite clearly a number of countries are involved, have been involved uh, in, in the dealings and the ongoings in Afghanistan. Could you perhaps for a couple of minutes, um, and then of course we dive in, into more detail in a couple of minutes, tell us where you see things in Afghanistan at the current moment. Thank you, Ali. Um, I think you're right. Uh, uh, Afghanistan is still a very important uh, uh, regional uh, position. Um, after what happened in, in last August and uh, we all realized that there is um, a big shift in the, in the political and also the secu uh, security situation uh, in West Asia. Um, UAE uh, have many relationships, either uh, you know, commercials, and I'm speaking from an official point of view, uh, commercial and also uh, security. We have also security concerns. Um, but also, we need to um, think that uh, Afghanistan has already been in decades of, of uh, unstable, instability, uh, terrorism, uh, poverty. So I think um, now most of us and also the international community, we need to assist uh, Afghanistan to come back and, and find ways for their people because they deserve a better life. Thank you so much for your initial remarks. From the view uh, from the UAE, so to speak, we will of course come back to you in just a moment to, to go into more detail and ask what the UAE, what role perhaps the UAE can and ought to play in the region. But let me go to Jim, Jim Bitterman here first. Jim, f you are an American based in Paris for many <laughs> decades. For the lack of Americans on this panel, I won't ask you to put on the Washington hat here, but, but of course, America's role is, is uh, extremely important here. Give us a sense in the first couple of well, minutes. Well, just to, just to contradict a little bit, uh, one of my fellow Americans, Stu Eisenstadt, who was just on the previous panel, and basically was saying that, it, uh, that uh, Afghanistan did not signal um, the uh, end of isolationism in the United States. It, 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 I, I think it is a kind of a neo-isolationism that we're seeing right now with the United States, that uh, after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, basically is a signal, I think, that uh, the U.S. is not going to fight any further um, regional conflicts that don't make 
a, a big difference to their strategic ambitions, whatever the strategic policy is for the United States, strategic interests, those are the things that are going to take the priority, and it'll be things like China and, and other things. But uh, the, the, the idea that we're going to become involved uh, in, in, in regional conflicts, it looks like, to me anyway, that uh, it's uh, no longer the case. Absolutely, and America's role here, uh, more than pertinent throughout 20 years, this has been America's lo longest running war sure. for two decades. Um, and all the questions that come with it, of course, what does mm -hmm. it mean for the future standing reputation, perhaps, of the U.S. moving forward? I'll come back to you sure. in just a moment. But let me go to Renault here, who is a very prestigious uh, war correspondent, senior reporter, who's been to Afghanistan more than a dozen times. You've written a book, Return to Peshawar. You've, you've experienced the Mujahideen, you've experienced the Taliban, and now you see a return of the Taliban, Renault, for the first couple of minutes. Um, how surprised are you that things are the way they are in Afghanistan at the current moment? Je crois que c'est un moment très important, effectivement, dans l'histoire des relations internationales, parce que c'est la mort, je dirais, ignominieuse du néoconservatisme américain dans des conditions qu'on n'attendait même pas, si vous voulez. Personne dans nos générations croyait que les Américains allaient refaire le coup de Saïgon 1975, mais ça ne les a pas gênés. Ils l'ont refait sans nécessité, parce qu'il était très facile de garder la base aérienne de Bagram et de continuer la discussion avec les talibans, avec une carotte et un bâton, et obtenir un gouvernement unitaire ou d'unité en Afghanistan, qui n'est évidemment pas le gouvernement qui a été euh, annoncé euh, par les talibans. Je crois que ce qu'il faut bien comprendre dans toute cette histoire, c'est qu'il y a eu deux guerres d'Afghanistan. La première guerre d'Afghanistan, elle commence le 7 octobre euh, 2001, avec l'intervention avec les missiles qui sont euh, tirés contre Kaboul, euh, et euh, qui euh, finit avec une intervention brillante de la CIA auprès de l'Alliance du Nord, avec Kaboul qui tombe le 13 novembre 2001. Donc c'est un très grand succès. Et les talibans qui se retirent de toutes les villes afghanes et qui vont se réfugier dans les zones tribales au Pakistan. Et là, ce succès, cette libération de Kaboul, en tout cas ce qu'on appelle la libération de Kaboul, la liesse à Kaboul lorsque l'Alliance du Nord est arrivée, c'était les images sur toutes les chaînes de télévision, a provoqué une ivresse américaine, euh, qui s'est retrouvée euh, dans la conférence, euh, de, euh, la conférence de Bonn du 5 décembre 2001, où les Américains ont décidé, euh, en fait, une deuxième intervention, qui était une, une intervention de nation building, euh, où ils ont promis euh, le, euh, le, de reconstruire l'Afghanistan, de démocratiser l'Afghanistan, je dis bien démocratiser l'Afghanistan, et de développer économiquement euh, l'Afghanistan. Ils n'étaient pas obligés de faire ça. Ça, ça, ça fait penser au, au, à la mission civilisatrice de la colonisation de Jules Ferry. C'est un projet absolument incroyable. Euh, mais euh, ils ont pris euh, cet engagement et Joe Biden a accepté cette intervention et il est même allé à Kaboul soutenir euh, ce projet grandiose de démocratiser et de développer euh, euh, l'Afghanistan. Les Américains auraient très bien pu se contenter de la première guerre où ils avaient détruit tous les éléments arabes internationalistes qui se trouvaient euh, en Afghanistan et toutes les cellules euh, d'Al-Qaïda en Afghanistan. Ils ont fait ce choix de, de nation building, d'une guerre d'intervention en, euh, en Afghanistan et ils ont donner la tâche, n'est-ce pas, de euh, reconstruire l'Afghanistan à des soldats, les soldats de l'OTAN. Euh, et ça, c'est l'erreur, l'erreur incroyable, stratégique qu'a fait l'Amérique, c'est de dire, de donner à des soldats de faire les pro Provincial Reconstruction Teams et euh, sans comprendre que le paysan afghan n'appréciait pas d'avoir chez lui des des hommes étrangers en armes. Et après, tout a... Euh, après, l'échec était déjà euh, signé à right. ce moment-là. 
Right. Uh, many, many important points that you have uh, raised here, I know, as someone who knows Afghanistan very well, and perhaps the American uh, mistake of trying to engage in nation building um, and what that means uh, for the future. You have correctly pointed out, of course, that this has started with the war on terror post 9-11, which we have just commemorated the 20th anniversary of, of Mark, which brings me to you, because you wrote a book on uh, the war on terror, where Afghanistan, of course, is uh, prominently feature 20 years later, 20 years after the fatal attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, the Amer Americans go in. Um, 20 years later, the hastened withdrawal, as Renault put it, with Vietnam-like photos. And here we are. Your opinions? Yeah, you're right, Ali. I mean, what we witnessed this summer was not just the withdrawal of US troops from Afghanistan. It's actually the, the end of a strategic cycle, a strategic cycle that started 20 years ago with 9-11. And actually, it ended in a failure, in a dramatic failure. So I agree with uh, Renaud Girard's comment. It's a very important event that we attended this, uh, this summer. Actually, the objective of this war on terror was defined by George W. Bush at the time, and there were three goals. Uh, the first one was to eradicate Al-Qaeda, and it was not done, actually. Al-Qaeda still exists. It's in Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda Central, but also Al-Qaeda in uh, the Asian subcontinent. The second objective was to get rid of all uh, terrorist groups of global reach. Mm. That's a pretty blurred expression. And the fact is that 20 years ago, ISIS did not exist. But now we not only have Al-Qaeda, but we also have ISIS, which obviously is a terrorist group uh, of global reach. Mm. And then the third objective uh, was to neutralize or to eradicate the uh, actors, whether groups or states, that hosted uh, international terrorist groups. And obviously here we're speaking about the Taliban. And not only uh, were the Taliban not defeated, but they're now in power uh, in Kabul. So obviously that's a major failure for the US, but also for the US allies uh, who were uh, very much involved in, in Afghanistan and France was part of the game. Yeah, so the war on terror uh, that uh, the US and the West in form of NATO has conducted for the previous two decades, now with the swift return of uh, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, most probably uh, you can argue whether it was a success or not. I, I think that uh, we will go into uh, more detail. But uh, Tatiana, let me come to you here, because before we talk about the United States here, and rightly so, of course, because this has been America's longest running war, but before the Americans, the Russians were there. And, and I'm sure they have a thing or two to, to say about the current situation. They can draw from personal experiences. Absolument. Si je devais euh, résumer aujourd'hui l'attitude russe à l'égard de l'Afghanistan et à l'égard des talibans, je dirais qu'il y a une certaine euh, dualité. Monsieur Vitaly Naoum qui en avait mentionné que les talibans euh, font partie de la liste des organisations terroristes interdites en Russie, ce qui donne lieu à des euh, formulations par les agences officielles d'information russe dans le genre le ministre des Affaires étrangères Sergei Lavrov a exprimé son soutien aux talibans, entre parenthèses, organisation terroriste interdite dans la Fédération de Russie, pour son soutien dans la lutte contre l'État islamique. Et cette dualité, on la retrouve en fait dans l'attitude à l'égard des talibans, parce que d'une part, il y a un bagage extrêmement lourd, le souvenir de la guerre des dix ans en Afghanistan, qui a beaucoup marqué autant les élites que les sociétés russes, et Vladimir Poutine, au mois de septembre, a dit que la Russie n'interviendra pas militairement en Afghanistan. Il a dit « Nous avons fait cette expérience, nous en avons tiré les leçons ». Et en même temps, depuis 2014, la Russie parle aux talibans. Ça, on peut rentrer un peu dans le dé détail comment et pourquoi. Mais selon les sources talibanes, euh, cette année, euh, la Russie fait partie euh, des trois premiers soutiens en matière financière, en matière de vente d'armes aux talibans. Elle est dans une démarche très pragmatique de parler à toutes les forces, etc. Puis je pense qu'aussi il y a un point important à comprendre, c'est que pour euh, les Russes, aujourd'hui, l'ennemi principal, c'est l'État islamique. Donc elle voit les talibans un peu comme alliés dans cette lutte entre les deux mots, elle choisit le moindre. Et cette dualité-là, on la retrouve aussi à l'égard du retrait des Américains de l'Afghanistan. D'une part, c'est considéré comme une sorte d'opportunité géopolitique, et ça quand on voit les premières réactions dans les médias russes, dans les euh, shows télévisés, etc., c'est une sorte de... 
satisfaction. Les Américains n'ont pas fait mieux que nous et ça nous laisse de la place et de la marge de manœuvre aujourd'hui pour faire mieux. Ça va attirer les autres pays vers nous en tant que fournisseurs de sécurité plus crédibles. Et en même temps, vous avez les forces de sécurité et de renseignement qui sont extrêmement inquiets avec les risques sécuritaires que ça puisse générer. Yeah, so, so very interesting, a bit of a mixed, if not schizophrenic feeling in Moscow about the events in Afghanistan. On one hand, perhaps a dose of glee, if not schadenfreude, about the failure of the West and NATO in particular. But on the other hand, of course, security concerns uh, very much on their own. And when it comes to security concerns, uh, MK Narayana, we're not far from India, of course. Uh, Afghanistan very much in the geopolitical proximity of your country and with the pertinent uh, and uh, uh, a crucial role that Pakistan, your neighbor, is playing in Afghanistan. I'm sure uh, Af Afghanistan, a country that you know well, has been very much on the radar. What's the view in New Delhi? What's the new from uh, New Delhi these days? Uh, apart from the view of New Delhi, I think there's a view of all Indians. First and foremost, we're looking around on the, uh, the panel here. I'm the only one who re sees this as a South Asian tragedy. It's most of the others are out, I'm sorry to use the word, are outsiders. The Russians came in at one stage, and of course went back without doing. The Americans came, hoped to create democracy and uh, kind of thing, and they've gone back. And who are left to pick up the pieces? The nations of South Asia. Afghanistan is part and parcel of South Asia. What happens in South, South Asia is therefore a matter of great concern for each and every South Asian country. And that's the largest country in South Asia. And more so, a civilizational con uh, with civilizational links with Afghanistan, it goes, goes back many thousands of years. For us, the, Afga the Afghanistan tragedy is felt in every single home in India, apart from the governments involved. Because for most of us, particularly my generation, the Pathan was the most friendly soul in the Indian neighborhood. He was a very generous individual who looked at that. So, the tragedies that have fallen on, on Afghanistan over the years has been a matter of great deep concern for most, most Indians. So, the first and foremost thing is the lesson that I think we need to, uh, which is the lesson which I heard a number of other speakers speak when you talk of the uh, Middle East and other places. Please take into view the opinions of the, the nations of the region and please don't impose solutions. And if you do impose a solution, don't do what happened in, um, by the Americans uh, recently. They just left. You must have an organized retreat. You can't leave the, a country in shambles. So we have a nation tragedy of a certain. We have a South, greater South Asian tragedy. And I think that is the issue that we need to, because we have to now link up and find out what do we do next. And since you've given us me only a couple of minutes to begin with, I just want to add one more point. The last two days we have heard about the problems in the rest of the world, or many parts of the world at least. I think nothing symbolizes this more than the shambolic nature of what Afghanistan is today. There is clearly, clearly what I would call uh, a crisis of confidence in how to manage problems and, and difficulties. Whether the Taliban, now that it has taken power in Afghanistan, will be able to come in Afghanistan or not is still a matter of. I, for one, do not believe that the Taliban is capable of governing Afghanistan because Afghanistan is not one country. Afghanistan is a construct of several Pashtun tribes. They've never had a central authority. They've never been a single focal point. And if uh, President Bush, with whom with whom I dealt with extensively and I greatly revere, thought that he could impose democracy in Afghanistan with all the, whether it is the CIA or the State Department, I think it was the biggest folly that anybody could have thought of. So I think we need to remedy this kind of thing. How will, how will we move forward is uh, the, the issue. But I leave, since you don't want me to go into everything in the beginning, I, I will leave it at this point. And I just want to add one more point. I think Tatiana mentioned this, I think, that what is the result of foreign intervention? Oh, no, sorry, not Tatiana, it was Vitaly who said that. Two decades of foreign intervention. 
what are the, well, none of the objectives. I can at least understand if something was left behind. When Hamid Karzai was there, at least we had something like a, a democratic administration somewhere in place. Uh, the primary objective, as Vitali explained, is the expert on terror. On the, in books, I'm on the, the terror on the ground, <laughs> having cited it. Destruction of the terror networks like Al-Qaeda has clearly not happened. Al-Qaeda is stronger today than what it was, I would like to say. And, right. And I speak with knowledge. Then we have a lot of newer outfits. The Daesh has come into, into existence, the Islamic State, the ISISK. So this has, been a this has been a great tragedy that has been visited on the people of South Asia. I leave it at that and I will talk to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Much, many more points to be raised throughout this discussion for sure. And uh, your country's perspective and your experience is, is uh, extremely pertinent to this discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Narayan. I will, I'll come back to you in just a second. But let me turn to Mr. Alzabi here once uh, more. What role moving forward? Uh, now we have more or less established the status quo. Uh, about what is going on in Afghanistan and what the current situation is. I think the more important question is how it will evolve. Uh, what can we expect? What role do you foresee, if any, of your country? What role does the UAE have to play? What role can the region uh, play in what the future holds for Afghanistan? I know it's a, tri it's a very tricky, tricky role there. Um, I think, Ali, uh, first of all, we need to respect the will of the Afghanis. That's uh, a major uh, issue. I mean, uh, my colleagues here, they mentioned interventions. We had two major interventions, uh, clear, but there are other interventions, you know, uh, from uh, unfortunately neighboring countries. So um, we need to respect the will of the, the Afghanis. The other issue for us as um, one of the, uh, um, in the session, 13 mentioned that we need to look forward, um, stop looking back to the history. Really, we need to build on what we have now. Now we have uh, um, a regime, either we accept it or not in Afghanistan. So we need to assist that regime to, and call him to let all the different uh, um, ethnic groups, different parties to participate in that government. I mean, my friend from, from India just mentioned that uh, Taliban is, is Bashtun. Yes, it's, it's a Bashtun, but also we need to uh, make sure that the other uh, minorities, the Hazar, the, uh, the Tajiks, you know, the, the, the rest of, uh, of, of the different uh, parties, they need to come and join uh, and to be included in, the, in, that, in that government. Um, women, women also. I mean, I, I'm not sure that the, the current government has any, any women in it, you know. No. So it, it, it has to, uh, um, let's see. Um, I think also um, the, 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 the country really now is running through very catastrophic financial, uh, you know, uh, some type of, of uh, uh, bank rub, 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 rub. I think we need to make sure that uh, we need to support the Afghan right. people. That's why UA is giving a lot of aids and also uh, <laughs> we, we assisted in, in so many uh, you know, uh, tens of thousands of evacuation operation. Uh, really now we have like more than 10,000 people uh, waiting for their final destination in UAE. And if I can just jump in and follow up, you said we need to respect the will of the Afghan people. Do you think the current situation with the Taliban back in power adequately reflects the we, will of the Afghan people? No, we need to call the Taliban and uh, whatever uh, means we have, uh, either you know, the pressure or, or, or the carrot, you know, we need to make sure that the different ethnic groups, the different tribes, uh, you see, Taliban has uh, a very unique culture uh, uh, situation. You cannot impose also, you know, um, a different culture on them. Uh, so 
I mean, we, we tried, or, or the, 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 some countries or the international community tried uh, other types of regime. Unfortunately, it didn't succeed. I mean, either you're talking about the 70s or in, in the, uh, after the, in the, this millennium. So really, I think we need to make sure that they choose their own way, but also we need to tell them that there are, there are some international concerns mm -hmm. and also they, not, they need to respect the international law and also they have to uh, make sure that they cannot work alone without... But uh, your premise, of course, implies that the Taliban would agree to a free and fair election. There, there, well, there are so many approaches to, <laughs> to, to convince. I, I can't say convince, but also uh, they, they are, for example, now saying that this is a transitional government. Right. You know? So let's see. Okay. Uh, during this period. And as you know, all of us are really uh, are monitoring and observing. Right. Well, the interesting point. Very much so, Mr. Al Zabi. Very much appreciate it. Let's see if the Taliga Taliban itself sees itself as a transitional power. That, that remains to be seen. But, Jim, um, com coming back again to uh, the U.S. role here and, and um, the, the role, the, the wound licking, if you will, still continues in Washington. As a matter of fact, perhaps unprecedented. You have two generals. Uh, in front of Congress, disputing the accounts of Joe Biden, saying, no, we advise him to keep, to keep at least 2,500 troops on the ground. He disagreed with us, or he went forward without taking into account. That's unprecedented. Yeah, it, it plays into something I'd just like to say to what, what MK said. He said, you needed to organize a retreat. I don't think any American uh, in the military or not wanted to see what we saw. Uh, that was not the outcome that they were looking for. Um, and no one knew that the, well, the Afghan military was going to collapse as fast as it did and the government was going to flee. And that, that whole thing was, uh, was uh, you couldn't plan for that. Um, and, uh, 20 years of national intelligence, they right. couldn't foresee they, what was happening. Well, you know, so I'll tell you what the generals said, what, where their failures were this last week. They said, uh, first we Americanized the war, meaning to say that they had, uh, they fought a war, they taught the... Afghan army how to fight along the lines of what the U.S. military does, and Reno hinted at that. Um, he said, they said that the, you have to have good visibility in the troops, and three years before the end, uh, the U.S. Withdraw, withdrew its uh, soldiers that were uh, out in the field with the Afghan troops and uh, could see what the hearts and minds were saying out there, what the, troop, what the Afghan troops were thinking. Uh, and probably would have realized to some extent how uh, corrupt the military had become. Uh, the, they said that um, you have to train for the culture, and this is something that the military, American military always makes a mistake at, and that is to sort of teach them how to use our high-tech weapons and things like that. And then when the infrastructure for the high-tech weapons goes away, um, they're at sea. Uh, and finally, don't watch the calendar, and this is something that MK looked at too, is it? You know, the, the idea that uh, the calendar was ticking, that everybody knew that, including the Taliban. So, um, you know, I just said an end date. And I just, just say two more things on that. Uh, of course. I, as an observer, uh, it's something that we've made a mistake, and, and Reno hinted at that too, was that uh, you don't rebuild societies, you don't reconstruct governments, you, you do nation building from the top down. You do it from the bottom up. And I mean, unless people of Afghanistan really want to create a democratic government or whatever government they want to create and they now have that opportunity, um, uh, you, you can't impose something, uh, Western norms on them, and you have to watch out for mission creep, which is what happened. I mean, we could have gotten out, as Reynolds said, we could have gotten out of Afghanistan at any point along the line in those 20 years, including uh, once Osama bin Laden had been killed uh, in, in 2011. Uh, 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 Barack Obama said in, in uh, 2014 that we had finished our military mission, and he almost declared an end to the war at that point in 2014. So, I mean, there were a number of stages along the line where the, the, um, the troops could have been withdrawn uh, and, and probably in a much better fashion than what we saw. Is, is that one of the main lessons that to, to both uh, the U.S., the West, NATO, whatever you want to call it, that nation building does not work? Is that one of the main lessons it, here? It, it really, it's hard to think of places, at times when it has. And I mean, you know, a lot of people would say, well, there's the Marshall Plan after World War II, um, Germany and France and uh, the other, uh, the other uh, victims of World War II were rebuilt. But the, it was a question of rebuilding a nation that already existed. 
as opposed to uh, what we saw in Afghanistan, which was essentially uh, trying to build some kind of a nation that didn't exist before. Renaud, you, you have covered Afghanistan, as I said, extensively. You were there during the first run of the Taliban, if you will, from 1996 to no, 2000. Aslan, uh, could I just intervene a point on which, I mean, just point, so that I won't lose the thread of what he said. Just quickly, oh. please, yes. No, I, I, he, um, you, you said that <clears throat> imposition. I think the, uh, the, the imposition of the president of, the, of Afghanistan, you know, the, the Americans decided to introduce as a friend, Hamid Karzai was there, all right, first choice. The choice of changing Hamid Karzai for Mr. Ashraf Ghani. No, um, Ashraf Ghani certainly is, a, is an outstanding individual, but certainly was the change was, was done because Hamid Karzai was not seen as an American puppet. And that was, a, I think these are fundamental failures I, uh, which you need to, re, when you said when you need to rebuild, okay, you went in open blind, probably did not know. But after that, we should realize that. I just think that we mentioned that because in, when you said of rebuilding, you have to rebuild in many ways, particularly of a nation that did not exist. That's, that, that's exactly yeah, what I yeah, said. Yeah, no, that's exactly yeah. what I said, that you, have to, we were, you were exactly. trying to rebuild a nation that didn't exist. Exactly. And, and I, oh, after World War II, there were nations that already exactly. existed that we were I, you know, I, I think correcting you were, the you destruction. Were, but you no. were spot on, Jim. I think you're spot on on that. I think you need to make that. I, I wanted to raise that point here because if right. you're trying it in the next time, please uh, take note of this fact. Right, and, and, and I will come to you, of course, in, in just a moment. But Renault, let me, let me get back uh, to the initial point of the Taliban. Everybody is wondering what is on their mind. Uh, some people have even talked about Taliban 2.0. This is a new Taliban. They have perhaps themselves learned some of the lessons throughout the first reign. They are trying to re-innovate themselves, reinvent themselves to the outside world, even using social media these days. Um, is, what, do you, what do you make of it? Uh, do you think this... this the, the Taliban 2.0 uh, is, is, is a PR stunt? Do you think they have changed? Uh, what can we expect from them? I think you have a reason to talk about the future, because we have seen that it was the death, ignominious, of the neoconservatism American, of this theory that privileges the idea that we make of democracy in relation to peace. Hein, les euh, réalistes comme euh, Kissinger pensent que la paix est la plus importante, les néoconservateurs pensent que c'est l'idée qui se font de la démocratie ou de la justice qui est la plus importante. Mais maintenant, cette euh, théorie néoconservatrice est, je pense, euh, morte. Euh, mais maintenant, il faut voir effectivement l'avenir. Et euh, personnellement, en tant que Français, je suis pour rouvrir notre ambassade à Kaboul. Parce que nous devons reconnaître, et dans les relations internationales, nous devons reconnaître les États et maintenir des relations avec les États, pas avec les régimes. Et je suis tout à fait opposé à la doctrine américaine. Dès qu'il y a un régime qui ne plaît pas aux Américains, il arrête d'entretenir des relations diplomatiques avec ce régime. C'est le cas, par exemple, de l'Iran. Il est tout à fait anormal que les Américains n'aient pas de relation directe avec l'Iran. Ils ont des différents. Très bien. Mais qu'il est... Euh, qu est... Et nous, euh, donc, nous devons, je pense, rouvrir euh, notre ambassade, essayer de euh, travailler avec les talibans qui sont là pour longtemps, comme le Parti communiste chinois est là pour longtemps en Chine. Voilà. Et donc, euh, nous ne sommes pas d'accord avec le régime chinois, mais nous devons parler euh, et entretenir une ambassade là-bas. Les talibans sont là pour longtemps. Les Américains leur ont redonné le pays sur un plateau d'argent. Ils pouvaient très bien euh, continuer à avoir une présence militaire à Bagram euh, et euh, obtenir, euh, les forcer à avoir un gouvernement d'unité nationale. Ils ne l'ont pas fait. Ils ont fait un choix. C'est une erreur stratégique majeure de Joe Biden. Ça va rester dans les annales comme une honte, mais c'est son problème. Aujourd'hui, je pense qu'il faut euh, parler avec euh, les talibans. Et d'ailleurs... C'est une politique que nous n'avions pas faite du temps du Mola Omar et que nous aurions dû faire parce que euh, le Mola Omar, on a pu travailler avec lui. Vous vous souvenez que euh, les Nations Unies lui avaient demandé d'éradiquer le pavot, l'héroïne d'Afghanistan. Et c'est une politique que le Mola Omar a faite et ça a été constaté par une mission de l'UNDOC en 2000 qu'il avait bien éradiqué le pavot ou 95% du pavot, 
d'Afghanistan. Il avait demandé en échange que les autres agences des Nations Unies aident ces paysans, la FAO, euh, enfin, toutes, les, toutes les organisations qui s'occupent d'agriculture. Et il n'a pas obtenu ça pour des raisons bureaucratiques, n'est-ce pas, euh, des euh, Nations Unies. Et je pense que même les Américains ont fait une erreur lorsqu'ils ont, euh, après le 11 septembre, ils ont euh, euh, sous-traité la négociation avec les talibans au service secret pakistanais. C'est une grave erreur, parce qu'on ne sait pas du tout ce que les pakistanais ont été dire aux talibans. Je pense qu'il aurait fallu aller voir les talibans eux-mêmes et leur dire avec beaucoup d'humilité, parce que quand on est très fort, il faut être humble, et les Américains étaient très forts en 2001, leur dire voilà, voilà ce qui s'est passé dans notre ville de New York, nous avons un problème, qu'est-ce que vous feriez à notre place, messieurs les talibans Et euh, faire de la diplomatie directe avec eux. Aujourd'hui, ils sont là, il faut leur parler, il, faut pas que, euh, il ne faut pas isoler ce pays, il faut continuer l'aide humanitaire, il ne faut pas punir deux fois, en fait, la population, euh, la population afghane. Nous l'avons puni une fois, en, enfin, les Américains l'ont puni une fois en trahissant leurs promesses, parce que les Américains ont clairement promis aux, aux Afghans la démocratie, euh, l'émancipation des femmes, etc. Donc là, ils ont été trahis, déjà. Mais il ne faut pas les punir une deuxième fois en isolant ce pays, en arrêtant l'aide humanitaire à ce pays, en arrêtant le commerce avec ce pays, il faut travailler au mieux avec euh, les talibans. Ça ne va pas être facile, mais ce n'est pas facile de travailler avec euh, les communistes chinois non plus. Il faut travailler avec eux et ne pas punir une deuxième fois, par idéologie, par idéologie euh, les, euh, les, euh, les talibans. Et en fait... La grave erreur qu'ont fait les Américains dans cette guerre, c'est d'avoir euh, imprégné les relations internationales d'idéologie. Et ça, c'était la mort des relations internationales telles que Kissinger les voulait. Et c'est Kissinger qui avait raison. Et ce n'est pas euh, Cheney et Rumsfeld W. Bush. Uh, let, let me just follow up because you made a very unambiguous, uh, passionate plea for the West to recognize the realities on the ground, to deal with the Taliban, said France should open, reopen its embassy uh, there. Uh, do you foresee, uh, because there are differences, of course, in opinion, as always within the European Union, uh, all countries uh, have their own motivations, some have their different approaches. Uh, do you think we should have a common European approach? as to how to deal with the Taliban moving forward. Because it's not going to do any good if 27 EU member states are having different sorts of relationships with Afghanistan and the Taliban. Do, are you pleading for a unified EU response uh, and approach, and how realistic is that? I think it's always useful to have a response united of the Union European Union. And we have it on the domain of economic, we have it on the domain of norms, we have it sur le domaine de l'aide internationale. Et euh, l'Union européenne a, a fourni beaucoup d'aide euh, à, à, à l'Afghanistan. Mais je pense que la politique étrangère commune de l'Union européenne est un rêve. Il faut, c est, c est pas, il y a si longtemps que les, les, les nations européennes se sont divisées sur la question néoconservatrice euh, de l'invasion euh, de l'Irak en 2003 pour, avait dit W. Bush, euh, construire la démocratie partout au Moyen-Orient. Donc vous avez eu d'un côté euh, les euh, Français et les Allemands right. qui se Let's sont opposés. Let's focus on the front. Voilà. voilà. Yeah. Donc euh, je pense que euh, je pense qu'il ne faut pas. Euh, c'est un c'est un c'est un vœu euh, à très long terme eschatologique euh, la, la politique étrangère européenne euh, commune et la politique de sécurité et la défense européenne commune. Mais euh, non, je pense qu'il faut faire. Yeah. Des, euh, des alliances ad hoc avec les pays qui veulent effectivement euh, faire quelque chose en Afghanistan et qui en ont les moyens, parce que pas tous les pays européens ont les moyens d'avoir une présence en Afghanistan. Nous, Français, nous avons un lycée euh, à Kaboul, un lycée euh, français à Kaboul, où euh, l'ancien roi Zahir a fait ses études, où le commandant Massoud a fait ses études. Je pense qu'il faut rouvrir ce lycée français. Nous avons une délégation archéologique très importante, il faut la rouvrir, il faut continuer nos travaux archéologiques. Et vous l'avez souligné, il y a plusieurs tendances chez les talibans, il y a une tendance dure, une tendance plus ouverte, 
mais en les c'est pas en les isolant, c'est pas en refusant de rouvrir notre ambassade qu'on va euh, qu'on va euh, permettre aux plus modérés de garder euh, le pouvoir. Donc je pense qu'il faut euh, avoir des relations avec right. ce pays. Euh, et ça veut pas du tout avoir des relations diplomatiques avec un pays ne veut ne signifie absolument pas right. approuver le régime politique right. de ce pays. But, so, uh... Mark, uh, I, yeah. I want to touch upon, I, I give you an opportunity uh, to respond right away and then I have a question for you. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I just want to follow up on that. I mean, I agree that we should talk to the Taliban, but there's a difference between talking and uh, an official recognition. That's the first point. The second point is that they have to walk the talk. They have now to demonstrate that what they say uh, is, is efficient, is correct, and is real. Uh, so. Just to follow up on your example, the reopening of the French high school. Let's say we do that, then we have to say, okay, we'll do it, but we want girls to attend this high school. And then what happens if it does not happen? If they forbid that, then we'll shut, shut down the school again, uh, and we're back to square one. So it's not an easy task. What I mean is that when you, once you decide to withdraw your troops and you lack leverage, you lack tools to put pressure, Uh, on the actors uh, in the country. So uh, I think that we, uh, the means we have now to, to put pressure on the Taliban and to uh, uh, have our own uh, clout on the evolution of the country is quite limited. And it would be very cynical to say, okay, our tool to put pressure on you is the, the financial aid that we, that we provide. And if we don't abide by our rules, then we'll cut the financial aid. I mean, that would be really cynical and I think we, should not go into this direction and of course it would be the Afghans that would suffer if we uh, take this, uh, this way forward. Jim, I know you want to jump in, but let me bring in <laughs> Tatiana and Mr. Nard. I'm, I'm going to come to you in just a second. Okay. The question is still, still how to deal with the Taliban moving forward, Tatiana. What, what is the view uh, from Moscow? What, what, what are the approaches, the tactics? Sur la question de la reconnaissance internationale des talibans, jusqu'à présent, euh, Sergei Lavrov, le ministre des Affaires étrangères, a dit ce n'est pas à l'ordre du jour. Et je pense que c'est une carte, une cartouche assez unique à tirer, sera durement négociée par les Russes, notamment pour obtenir un gouvernement euh, inclusif euh, en Afghanistan, ou, pour reprendre les termes de Sergei Lavrov, les faire agir d'une manière plus civilisée. Donc c'est une cartouche qu'on ne peut tirer qu'une fois, et elle est extrêmement importante. D'autres moyens de négocier avec les talibans, peut-être le lobbying russe pour certaines levées euh, ou l'affaiblissement des sanctions, car les Russes euh, considèrent que euh, les sanctions peuvent contribuer à la radicalisation du régime euh, qui serait aux abois en matière euh, financière et euh, économique. Et, et en fait, cette reconnaissance, si jamais elle a lieu, elle est extrêmement importante dans la politique russe, parce que jusqu'à présent, on a toujours dit, les Russes préfèrent les régimes laïcs, même autoritaires voire très autoritaire, au régime religieux, islamique, modéré. Donc ce sera un changement, un moment de rupture important, qui peut donner à la Russie plus de marge de manœuvre dans le monde musulman. Sinon, euh, la Russie fait beaucoup de choses sur euh, différents axes. D'une part, euh, en matière de renseignement, elle partage euh, le renseignement avec les pays de l'Asie centrale, notamment sur les différents groupes d'origine ethnique qui sont en Afghanistan, les mou différents mouvements terroristes, mais ils partagent aussi le renseignement avec les talibans en réalité. Et les, les Russes l'ont reconnu euh, en 2017 euh, officiellement, notamment sur les groupes de ISIS-K, l'État islamique euh, kazaran, euh, les, euh, les groupes qui se trouvent en Afghanistan, car c'est de là qu'ils considèrent qu'il y a la menace principale pour la Russie et pour les pays de l'Asie centrale, qui sont, dont certains sont liés à la Russie à travers l'organisation du, du traité de sécurité collective. Donc c'est une sorte de euh, « autant moins », ce n'est pas tout à fait euh, l'article 5 euh, de euh, l'Alliance atlantique, mais la Russie peut se retrouver entraînée, dans, euh, et ça, ça est arrivé par le passé, dans la guerre de Batkan par exemple, et euh, elle, peut, elle peut se laisser entraîner, donc c'est un point qui est extrêmement important. Elle travaille aussi beaucoup diplomatiquement, donc ça j'ai mentionné euh, la reconnaissance et ouais. euh, une éventuelle levée ou l'affaiblissement des sanctions. Et elle travaille aussi l'axe militaire. La Russie a deux bases militaires au Kyrgyzstan et euh, au Tadjikistan. 
elle travaille au renforcement du contrôle aux frontières. Elle a extrêmement peur des migrants, des réfugiés qui peuvent affluer dans ces pays-là. Et euh, elle a fait des exercices euh, au mois d'août et au mois de septembre d'une manière bilatérale et dans le cadre de l'organisation du traité de sécurité collective pour renforcer la capacité de ces alliés centra-asiatiques de résister. All right, thank you so much. Uh, in, indeed, Central Asia in general, thank you for pointing that out. We, because we've been talking about France, NATO, uh, America, and of course India, but Central Asia very much uh, involved there as well, MK Narayanan. Um, again, the question here that we are posing to this panel and to you in particular, uh, how ought the international community to deal with the Taliban <coughs> moving forward, recognizing, as Renault was pleading, recognizing the realities on the ground. What is your take? Who knows the reality on the ground? I think that's the first question that we need to address. <coughs> you, have, you have the Taliban, and as somebody said, is there a Taliban 2.0? How can you talk of a Taliban 2.0 when the interim government, we can quote, interim government, has a whole lot of, of internationally identified terrorists in their, in their ranks. And as uh, Vitaly said a few minutes ago, they have shown no indication that they have shifted outcome. And now we are not, we are not it's, it's interim. The government is interim. We don't quite know who's in power. And I think looking at it, the European Union will look into this problem or uh, somebody else will look into the problem. I think it's, if you have, it's very premature. We need to be clear what's, what's going to, what's going to uh, happen before we take the next step. Otherwise, we'll do exactly like what happened with the Bonn Accord and, and other issues way back in, at the beginning of 2000. So the first and foremost idea is to get a clear, clearer picture. And I don't think there is any clear picture. And the Taliban itself is not united. And you have Pakistan, which is the creator of the Taliban. The ISI created the Taliban. It's, it's common knowledge. It's not a great intelligence scoop to talk about it. So where does, where do, unless you can put some check on it. And today there is the Taliban is divided between the Quetta Shura and the Miran Shah Shura. So you know, the, the whole, uh, what I would call, the situation in Afghanistan, you have the Taliban who, is, who use its guns and weaponry to sort of get rid of the US or the NATO and US troops, and, and they've taken control. We don't know what is to be done. I think it's pre premature to, for us to talk in terms of whether the Russians or the Europeans or the so-and-so will kind of. I think you need a far better understanding of what we need to do, and I don't think we need to rush into the situation as if it's a problem that's going to be sorted out within the next 48 hours or the next uh, four weeks, etc. We, we need a much clearer understanding of what. And I don't think anyone... No. Are you willing to isolate Pakistan from the situation? I don't think it's possible to do that just now. Because as long as Pakistan exists and uh, it... The ISI will, be, will play a role in, in dealing with the Taliban. And therefore, at the moment, the United States has said that we will not deal with Pakistan for various reasons of the past, the present, etc. I don't know how they'll deal with the Taliban if you, if you keep the, uh, Pakistan out of, out of the reckoning. I mean, I would, I would love it to have that happen, but I don't know how, it, how practical it can be in terms of... So you need between a theoretical approach or a theoretical construct of how we should do and what we need to do on the ground, we need to. I don't think that, by, that tomorrow morning we are going to open schools or open embassies and children are going to, sc to schools and colleges, etc. There's nowhere on the, it is not on the horizon, there's nowhere on the sea. I, and I would, I would say that there is a certainly a major role for uh, South Asia and I would say uh, West Asia to, to play a role this time. Please let her allow, because I think there are far more. One step taken by the UAE, giving Ashraf Ghani a, a home to, to go there, because had he been, um, been there, by now he would have been history. So I think this, this is an understanding. It's, it's, a, it's a remarkable step that was taken with great deal. We didn't require great uh, in, uh, intelligence analysis, which is what the prerogative of many other countries. They took a decision on it. Because we need to have in, in position people who understand the situation. And I think there is a major role this time that South Asia and West Asia will have to play in any construct. And I hear about the European Union, etc., etc. I don't think they have a role. But I have a bigger point. I would think that this is a, 
of, uh, an opportunity for a global concert. We had a concert of Europe, as you remember, many years ago. So when the, the initial steps are taken by West and South Asia, then you can, we need to move towards a global concert and let's see what they can do, because let's not rush in. This problem is going to remain. If Afghanistan implodes even more than it does today, then I think there's a tragedy for all of us in South Asia. It's easy for the rest of the world to sort of look at it, but this is something that we live to. We don't want it. One and two are over. Now we don't want a three to, um, uh, to take place. So that's the point that I wish to emphasize. Thank you so much. It's an important point, Al Zabi. Uh, I know you wanted to jump in here because uh, MK Narayanan says, who knows what the reality on the ground is? Let the dust settle first before we make a decision. And if a decision is made, certainly this can no longer be as it was in the past, a decision-making progress that has taken place in the West. It has to be a much more comprehensive approach. Uh, I think, I think um, uh, all what's being said is right. Uh, but we have tried, someone mentioned sanctions. We have tried sanctions. We have tried to cut diplomatic uh, ties. We have tried military operations. And uh, unfortunately, none of these really had some type of success. So, and also, we have tried to engage with the government for the last two decades. But these are not the Afghan, Afghanistan government I, I can really consider it. It was Kabul government. Governments in the, the, the capital of Afghanistan. They don't have that authority, really, and uh, uh, to, to expand it on all over uh, Afghanistan. I think now we have to find a way, what we call it, engagement. But it has to be a comprehensive engagement. Uh, it has to be, have m d parallel approaches, political, um, financial aids, um, uh, also a preventive measurements, like what really, uh, I, I will just give you an example. I mean, uh, we are talking about terrorism and extremism, and uh, you know, we are really have a lot of fears and concerns that Afghanistan, it might become you know, a safe haven for, for, for uh, tourists coming from, from different uh, areas. Do we have a preventive uh, policy? We use a, pro a preventive strategy in Afghanistan. UA really educate nearly 2,000 clerks, you know, religious clerks, on moderate Islam. Mm. You know. <coughs> so, and that program ex extended for nearly 10 years, uh, which really, it was in, in the support, of course, with, with the, with the uh, uh, Kabul governments at that, at that, at that time. But really, we, we realize that it has a lot of benefits for, for, for the, the new generations. So we are talking about the new generation. We, we are looking uh, in, in, uh, ahead. Yes, Afghanistan, as I mentioned before, had really not that uh, excellent uh, history for the last three decades. But now I think it's our responsibility and also the, the, the Taliban and the Afghanis uh, responsibility to rebuild it again. Let me jump in. Reno Giro, for instance, make, it makes a very uh, clear point that we, the West, the world, should establish diplomatic relationships with uh, the Taliban. Mark Ecker says, not so fast. Let's see what the reality is on the ground. Uh, if, if they're walking the talk, if rights are being protected, if the progress that has been made over the past two decades is not being, being destroyed within a few weeks. What is your take? I think we, we should be engaged in uh, the Taliban, or, or the government, and also the people. So it's not just limited limiting our engagement with, with the government. I think we need, Afghanistan had enough, so we need to support the Afghani people. Jim, I know you wanted to jump in when uh, exactly. Renault, 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 Renault But just to take it forward one tiny notch, of course. and that is that uh, President Macron yesterday had a conversation with Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, and one of the topics of their conversation was Afghanistan. Um, so uh, we don't know what they talked about, the Elysee is not saying, but in any case, that conversation about Afghanistan has, has, has taken place and, and perhaps may be leading to something further on, opening of schools and who knows what. Secondly, I just wanted to take objection to your characterization of betrayal, uh, the U.S. betrayal of Afghanistan. If it was a betrayal, 
It was a betrayal that was a very costly one. The U.S. paid dearly for that betrayal. A trillion dollars and 6,000 <laughs> lives. And uh, so it wasn't a betrayal. It was a failure. Yes, and that general said that as much in, in a very humble way. I mean, they were totally humiliated uh, in front of the Congress, uh, admitting that, uh, you know, the Taliban were now in power, the enemy was now in power in Kabul. It was a failure. But betrayal... I don't go that far. I think, uh, I think it was a betrayal because as in Vietnam, in Vietnam, in, uh, in the, the Paris Accord, uh, America said to the South Vietnamese, we'll help you to fight, stand for democracy, stand for your values, and we will, we'll, we're, we're leaving Vietnam where we wanted to replace the French in 55, we, stand, we started, you know, and, but now we will help you. And then suddenly, it was due to the Congress, I will not come back to that, but they were dropped. And then you had the boat people, and you had the Red Khmers, and all what happened in Indochina. In Afghanistan, my point is that the United States was not compelled to do this nation building. Then won the first war, which was having uh, Northern Alliance in Kabul, and, and they, have, they had killed, I was there, they had killed all these Arab internationalist jihadists that were in Afghanistan and uh, dismantled all uh, the cells and so on. They chose, they chose this nation building in the Bonn Conference. They chose it. Uh, and, and it was the, this ideology, okay? So, you want to do it, I mean, success. And they said to the youth of Afghanistan, build information, build new medias. They said to the girls, I was there. I, I listened to what the Americans told them. I listened to what Khalil Zal told them. I listened to, to what the, the, the American radio in Afghanistan was saying. He said, Built your new, uh, we will help you build your new society and so on. And they had done that. And a lot of youth in Afghanistan believed in these American values. They believed deeply. And these people have been dropped. Why? Because, yes, they had built an army of 300,000 uh, soldiers. But when you say, I mean, morale in the army, Demoralization is very important when you, and that was a major mistake of Biden, and his generals were against it, you, are, you were right. When you say, we are going to drop a base, which is very easy to keep, Bagram, and you, you give a message to your ally, this army that they, they, they formed, okay, it's finished, we are, and, and by the way, if you think that negotiating with the Taliban without inviting in Doha uh, the Afghan uh, government and the Afghan army is not a betrayal, I don't know. That was, I don't that see was, any that other was Mr. Word Trump's. That. That, that was Mr. Trump's decision. That was not Mr. Biden's decision. This is Trump's decision. The, right, and, exactly. And, 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 and Biden followed this policy. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's a betrayal. Maybe America. Uh, uh, lost a lot of money in Afghanistan, sure, like it lost a lot of money in Mesopotamia and a lot of money in, in Indochina before 75. True. But if you tell me that negotiating uh, w uh, uh, the future of a country without inviting the government that you put in place uh, in the Bonn Conference is not a betrayal. I don't see well, any that, word for that. That was the previous administration, but let me just, and I'm not defending, I'm not from the administration, so I can't speak for the administration, but let me just say that now, okay, the Americans have left. So now the field is open. So now let's just see who comes in to improve a lot of women to educate uh, the children of Afghanistan. Right, and I, to, I think the to point- bring human rights. The, Who, who's gonna come in and fill the gap? Absolutely, I think the point you're raising is clear. This was a, a, a process that was initiated by Donald Trump, but it, it was seen through by, by Joe Biden. And I think in both cases, one could argue both decisions were primarily rooted in US domestic political uh, motivations. I, I, I think, think isolation, I, isolation does not, does not help. Right. And, uh, 
and we have an American uh, embassy should have been kept open. You have negotiated. America has given uh, Afghanistan to the Taliban. But why close the embassy? I mean, okay, maybe Afghanistan needs a government, any government, because we must not, no conservative forgot, the, no conservative, they are right, they hate political dictatorship. And Taliban is a political dictatorship. But there is worse, we have to remember that there is something worse than political dictatorship, it's anarchy. And there is something worse than anarchy, which is civil war. Now, in Afghanistan, we're between dictatorship and anarchy. A little bit of both. Please, let no go back to civil war. So it's why right. we have to be there in Afghanistan to have, uh, and to try to do the best so that a civil war right. does not resume in Afghanistan. We are nearing the final half an hour mark. And of course, I want to bring in the audience in just a bit. Not quite yet, not quite yet. Told your horses, I will come to you in just a <laughs> second because I can imagine there'll be a number. But I want to round up this, this round before we are uh, opening up. And I'm going to come to the three of you to, to, to wrap it up. Uh, let me start with Mark. As I said, you wrote a very comprehensive book on the war on terror. And there are U.S. generals who are saying, with the return of the Taliban, now we're seeing a return of al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is going to be is active in Afghanistan. They're saying an imminent threat, perhaps even an imminent attack on the U.S., could be realistic and feasible within the next five, six months. Is that your understanding? Is that, is that your assessment as well? well Joe Biden said that uh, al-Qaeda was gone. Uh, from Afghanistan, which is not true. Uh, so uh, we know that Al-Qaeda is still there, and we know that uh, the ties have been maintained over the past 20 years. And actually, there are proofs of that. I mean, for instance, there was a 2019 strike on a Taliban hideout in Musakala, and actually the emir uh, of uh, Al-Qaeda Al in the uh, Asian subcontinent was killed uh, in this operation. Uh, so today, again, the Taliban have to walk the talk on this topic as well. We cannot just believe what they say. They signed the Doha Agreement, and in the Doha Agreement, they said that they would break ties, but we have no control uh, over that. So, I mean, we need some evidence at some point. Right. And here, obviously, I mean, Al-Qaeda is different from ISIS because the Taliban and ISIS are at war. And uh, on the question of ISIS, uh, the, um, uh, our question is not basically if the Taliban are willing uh, to combat, to confront this group, but if they are able eradicate it. I mean, ISIS has approximately between 1,000 and 500 fighters and 2,000 and 200. Uh, that's quite a lot. Uh, and if, you, if they manage to uh, control some part of Afghanistan, then perhaps they, they can also export uh, their violence to the West or to South Asia. Right. Tatiana, there's no doubt that the hasty withdrawal on the part of the, uh, the United States is a damage to the reputation of, if not credibility, of the US, of the West, of NATO. I think there can be no, no doubt uh, about that. Um, again, we talked about the aspect of schadenfreude, perhaps, that is coming from Moscow and Beijing, looking at this. How, how lasting do you think uh, this reputational damage uh, truly is to the United States? Judging from where you are based. C'est justement ce que je disais au début, c'est là où uh, le retrait uh, des troupes américaines a été en partie perçu par les Russes comme une opportunité géopolitique. Je crois que c'est Zaki Laidi qui avait employé le premier jour le terme de « increase the leverage », augmenter les leviers d'influence, l'influence russe dans la région, mais aussi dans les pays qui sont voisinants des régions. Donc évidemment, c'est un grand dommage pour la réputation américaine, dont les Russes souhaiteraient et espèrent bénéficier. Avec la Chine Évidemment, c'est ce qu'on voit en premier, le tandem qui pourrait éventuellement surcharger du problème et euh, peut-être dans le cadre de l'organisation de coopération de Shanghai. De fait, l'Afghanistan, qui a le statut d'observateur dans cette organisation, a tous les pays limitrophes, le, euh, sauf le Turkménistan, qui sont membres de cette organisation. Mais on sait aussi les faiblesses de cette organisation qui est déchiré par les contradictions et les blocages, notamment entre l'Inde et le Pakistan, mais il y en a aussi d'autres. Donc la question aujourd'hui, je vois dans les milieux d'expertise en matière de relations internationales en Russie, le sujet qui est brassé, 
c'est euh, peut-on avoir une sorte de multilatéralisme à la carte au sein de l'organisation de coopération de Shanghai pour euh, gérer ce problème-là. Mais le problème qui va se poser, c'est le problème entre l'efficacité, donc créer un groupe plus petit pour gérer euh, les, les, le souci de, de l'Afghanistan et proposer des solutions, et la légitimité, il faut que ça puisse être accepté par tous les autres. Mais euh, en tout cas, euh, le dernier sommet de l'organisation de coopération de Shanghai au mois de septembre s'est saisi du problème et a formulé euh, son souhait de voir l'Afghanistan euh, neutre et euh, pacifique. Donc euh, on va voir quels sont... En même temps, il n'y a, a pas de piste, je ne vois pas de piste euh, concrète qui se dégage. Il est juste question de retravailler euh, cette idée de création d'un groupe euh, au sein de l'organisation de coopération de Shanghai, mais euh, rien de concret pour l'instant. Et puis je voulais euh, juste dire deux mots. Euh, vous avez dit qui connaît la réalité du terrain. Euh, très honnêtement, je pense que les Russes étaient pas mal au courant euh, de, de ce qui se passait. Euh, il, depuis 2017, ils anticipaient en fait la, la chute éventuelle du gouvernement Ghani euh, et c'était dans l'espace public, en fait, ces craintes-là sur la fragilité de ce régime. Et je pense que c'est l'un des facteurs qui a poussé les Russes à discuter avec les talibans, ce pragmatisme, cette vision de la réalité du terrain, dépourvue au fond de, de l'idéologie dans la meilleure optique possible, encore une fois, pour les Russes, le vrai problème, c'est moins les talibans que leur soutien éventuel ou pas à différents grépuscules basés sur leur territoire. Juste pour rappel, Vladimir Poutine est arrivé au pouvoir en pleine guerre de Tchétchénie et euh, les franges les plus radicales de combattants au Nord-Caucase étaient soutenues depuis le territoire de l'Afghanistan et euh, l'Afghanistan, la, sous le premier règne des talibans, était le seul pays au monde à avoir reconnu l'Ichkiri indépendante. L'Ichkiri, c'est le terme pour la Tchétchénie. Donc c'est aussi la question, quelle attitude des talibans vis-à-vis -vis des mouvements séparatistes dans les pays avoisinants Right, so, so Russia already had, uh, at least in terms of vision and tactics, a leg up. You're saying they were already arranging themselves for a new reality. And China, as we know, you mentioned, of course, unlike the US, has a somewhat pragmatic approach when it comes to conducting foreign policy. So they will be dealing you know, with the Taliban perhaps in a very uh, di different manner. Uh, uh, let's, let's round it up by bringing in MK uh, Narayan one more time before I uh, handed it over to, to the audience. I know you wanted to jump into it. No. <laughs> I want to be, I'm being, I'm the devil's advocate in this point in time. I think this isn't an issue of, of um, whether the European Union or Russia or, or the Americans. We have a problem. There is a huge implosion that is taking place in Afghanistan. The jihadists across the world have, have, have been electrified as a result. We already see the thing, Al-Qaeda and its acolytes like the Lashkar-e Taiba and the Jaish e Mohammed in in the, in the South Asian context, I have become one. We see a great deal of revival of the ISIS, particularly the Khorasan group of the ISIS. So these are the, these are the issues. The, there is another problem that people are not talking about. The opium trade has more or less doubled or tripled in the course of the last few weeks. There's nobody talking about it. What are we talking about? We have to stem that. We, we, nations that deal with it. We can't wait for governments to be established before you do. We need to deal with that problem. Then finally, there is, you have the problem of how do you deal with it? Now, Tatiana was talking of the SEO. Now, the, you start off by saying the SEO doesn't include the United States. So, I mean, we cannot, that's why I refer to a global concert. We require the world to look at this problem because what is going to happen in uh, Afghanistan in the next um, year or so is going to dictate what is the course of events across the world in there. Are you, are, do you want to, uh, to deliver the world to, uh, to the terrorists? There is, the Taliban is, is, is a, what I call a, a excretion on the, on the face of the, of the earth in that sense. So we need to deal with it. And I think we read, I think we should have a global concert, a group of nations. We've had that in the past. It should include, therefore, not, uh, not only the countries of Europe and this and that, because that, but certainly, I mean, one of the prime candidates for that would be the UAE, because it has been done and it's got a now a record of doing many of these things. Certainly a country like India. How do you keep Pakistan out of it will have to be a major factor, because it is the... Okay. So, 
least look at this problem from this perspective. Let us not allow ourselves to be driven by old kind of thing. But the United States in particular needs to show ideological diversity. As, as has been mentioned here, where you can't say we will not deal with this and we will not look at them because of kind of thing. So I leave that because if I think we've run out of time. I have a lot more to say, but that doesn't matter. Uh, most, most definitely. And we will have more to say because we're going to the uh, audience now. I think your point that Afghanistan is one of the uh, most uh, uh, prominent geopolitical challenges awaiting us in the 21st century, I think they can note be no two opinions about this, which is why the World Policy Conference has prominently featured this panel here on the subject matter. Let's open up. We have approximately uh, 20 minutes left, uh, and we're going to the first row here. Uh, microphone is, uh, is coming to you. As a matter of fact, I already see quite a number of hands. So what I would just suggest is we do two rounds. We're going to take three questions at once, so please take notes uh, of them. I will come to you. and, and be as brief, uh, being mindful of the time, be as brief with uh, your questions as you can be, please. Oui, uh, je vais essayer d'être uh, bref sur une question très complexe. Je viens du Sénégal, qui est un pays limitrophe du Mali, uh, dans la zone du Sahel. Alors, évidemment, cette uh, <coughs> question nous intéresse au plus profond de nous, parce que ce qu'il faut savoir, et je crois que ça a été dit tout à l'heure, c'est... Euh, Est-ce que les talibans vont rester dans le cadre de leur, de leur zone géographique et délivrer ce qu'ils veulent délivrer à leur peuple, etc. Ça, c'est une question interne. Ou est-ce que ça va être, comme ça a été dit, euh, le centre névralgique euh, de développement du terrorisme international avec une implication euh, au Sahel Ça, c'est une question très pratique euh, qui est posée à tous les pays, et y compris un pays qui est très important dans le Sahel, parce qu'il a aussi, euh, disons, une, euh, une intervention euh, voilà, au Mali. Ça, c'est une question aussi qui se, pose, qui se pose à la France, mais qui se pose à la communauté internationale. Est-ce qu'aujourd'hui, euh, l'Afghanistan va être le nouveau centre névralgique d'opération du mouvement terroriste international Ça, c'est la grande question qui va se poser, et je crois qu'une réponse doit être donnée euh, si il y a, et c'est du réalisme que de vouloir parler à ceux qui sont sur place, ouais. mais il y a des conditions de départ. Ça, je crois que c'est ce que je considère comme étant non négociable. Euh, right. Ce qu'on aura appris de cette crise, évidemment, c'est que c'est illusoire right. de vouloir faire de la construction euh, d'un État-nation sans les citoyens de ce pays, euh, et ça a échoué. Et d'ailleurs, je suis étonné par le fait que de grands... Un grand pays comme les États-Unis ne retiennent jamais les leçons. Right. On avait l'impression que c'était du Saigon euh, 40 ans plus tard. Mais ça, c'est une question euh, qui intéresse certainement euh, bon, les États-Unis right. et l'Afghanistan. Mais pour ce qui concerne l'Afrique et le Sahel, c'est une question euh, fondamentale qui se pose. Et j'aimerais bien avoir l'avis euh, de, euh, de, 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 des panélistes. Thank you. C'est un risque for supplémentaire sure. Sure. pour la question. I, th I, th I think you... Thierry, go ahead. Yes, if you allow me. Uh, it, I, I speak in French. Uh, initialement, j'avais conçu cette session un peu différemment. Uh, mon idée initiale, c'était de traiter de l'Afghanistan et du Sahel en même temps, pour voir quelles leçons on pouvait tirer de l'Afghanistan pour le Sahel. Bon, plusieurs amis m'ont convaincu que uh, le sujet de l'Afghanistan uh, devait occuper la session entière. Mais effectivement, si dans les minutes qui restent, on pouvait euh, tirer quelques enseignements opérationnels pour euh, la conduite à tenir vis-à-vis -vis du Sahel dans les euh, semaines et mois qui viennent, ça pourrait être intéressant. Right, thank you so much. I think the question will be raised in just a moment in the answers about uh, perhaps the comparisons between the Sahel and, and mm. the Afghanistan. Uh, I will come to you in just a moment, but we're going to collect a few questions. Uh, go ahead, please. Thank you, Ursula. Uh, have comments, then and a question. Uh, okay, let's my make, comments let's be brief. for the American, yeah. The American, they create mess when they step in, they create mess when they step out. This has happened in Iraq, this has happened now in Afghanistan. You never succeed to make a democracy. You are a su successful in destruction, not construction. Now, my question, in dealing with Taliban, okay, now we have all these uh, well, the, the, when, the, when the Americans step out with all their intelligence, they did not calculate who will be the winner, who will be the loser 
definitely they are the first loser and the biggest loser. They wanted to create problem for China, for Russia. It happens that China is winning. Iran is the big winner. Now, in dealing with Taliban, with all, there is no consensus between all those actors in Afghanistan, uh, China, Russia, France, all of them, even us, Qataris. Okay, how you are going to approach Taliban with all this conflict of interest? Okay, which model Taliban is going to be with ISIS, with Al Qaeda there? We are not only Asia, we are now the target of Al Qaeda recruiting the Arab youth. There is a call for recruiting Arab youth. We are the first uh, uh, whom they are going to be uh, threatened right. from Al Qaeda. Thank you so much. Can you pass on the, the microphone to the ambassador in the first row to, to round up the first line of questions? And I'm, I'm coming to you for the second round. Please go ahead. So, so far, we have uh, the situation in Sahel versus Afghanistan. We have a question which I think we have addressed about how the international community should deal with the Taliban, but uh, free to elaborate further. And the last one for the opening round. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ali. Uh, my question addressed to Mr. Gerard. Uh, you made it very clear that waiting for an EU unified political decision is a, is a wishful thinking, basically. Where does that leave us? Would it more focus on the bilateral relation with Europe? And my other part, uh, other part of the question is the influence of Europe in Afghanistan and in the region post Merkel. Would that put more pressure on the Elysee Palace or that will be an opportunity? For the French government. Thank you so much. Uh, let's dive right in, Mark, without wasting much time because we want to go to a second round of questioning. The, the comparison Sahel Afghanistan, the comparison, the, the, mutual, uh, the mutual overlapping, perhaps. Go ahead. Ali, uh, I will uh, answer in French, Madame la Ministre. Um, je, je ne suis pas sûr que l'Afghanistan redevienne le centre névralgique du, du terrorisme international. On ne le sait pas, en fait, aujourd'hui. C'est toute la question qu'on se posait sur les relations entre les talibans et Al-Qaïda et sur leur capacité à éradiquer ou pas Daesh. Euh, je crains que en fait, le centre de gravité du djihadisme ne se soit déjà déplacé vers le sud et en particulier vers l'Afrique, avec trois fronts qui existent. Un front historique dans la corne de l'Afrique avec les Shebabs en, en Somalie, euh, un front autour du bassin du lac Tchad avec euh, l'ex-Boko Haram et Daesh qui est présent, et puis le front qui... Euh, occupe beaucoup la France et ses alliés européens et locaux, évidemment, qui est la bande sahélo-saharienne. Et là, je crois qu'il faut dire que la situation a à la fois des points communs et des différences nettes avec ce qui se passe en Afghanistan. La première différence qui est notable, c'est que la France n'est pas arrivée là-bas pour changer un régime et pour essayer de faire du nation building ou du state building. La France est arrivée à la demande d'un État local pour lui venir en aide et pour essayer de rétablir la souveraineté de cet État sur l'intégralité de son territoire, avec l'assentiment des organisations internationales, et en particulier de l'ONU, qui est également présente avec la, la MINUSMA. Il y a d'autres différences, évidemment, sur l'environnement, puisqu'on n'a pas des grandes puissances comme la Chine, l'Iran, etc., dans l'environnement du, du Sahel, ce qui pose tout un tas de, de difficultés. Mais c'est vrai qu'il y a aussi des points communs, un point commun euh, très important, c'est qu'on n'arrive pas, euh, dans le fond, à traiter les, les problèmes, les récriminations de la population, et en particulier les demandes de justice, de dignité, de bonne gouvernance. Euh, et ça, c'est, je pense, une limite fondamentale de l'ingénierie euh, sociale, politique, diplomatique et militaire euh, des interventions occidentales de ces deux dernières décennies. Euh, et je ne sais pas vrai, véritablement comment on va pouvoir euh, l'améliorer. Mais pour répondre à la question de Thierry, je pense que s'il y a une leçon à retenir, c'est qu'il ne faut pas partir, en tout cas pas partir comme ça. Et je pense qu'on peut maintenir une force minimale qui nous permet d'avoir encore notre voix au chapitre. Et en particulier de faire du contre-terrorisme, ce qui n'est clairement pas la panacée, ce qui ne permet pas de résoudre les problèmes de gouvernance, les problèmes fondamentaux qui nourrissent le terrorisme, mais ce qui permet au moins d'essayer d'endiguer la menace. On est plus capable de l'éradiquer, ça c'est assez clair, c'est une leçon des 20 dernières années, mais il faut au moins qu'on soit encore capable de l'endiguer pour éviter qu'il euh, y ait un autre front qui s'ouvre en Afrique de l'Ouest. Mm. Right. Thank you so much. 
it, if I, you want to add a sentence to the Sahel I, Afghanistan I just comparison. To add, just, to, just to add one thing, and that is the, that the French should be very cautious about what they're doing in the Sahel, because you say there's no superpower. The Russian Wagner Group uh, has been reportedly moving in. This is not an officially government group, but it's a private group that sanctioned by the government who may be moving in there to, to cause problems for the French military. And the second thing is that uh, I think uh, the view from Paris is that uh, the withdrawal, yes, it would be managed and it would be a, a replacement of European troops, but where are those European troops coming from? And where is the, where is the uh, unanimity within Europe about bringing in those troops to support, the, uh, to fill the void being left by the French troops? M.K. Narayanan, go ahead. No, I, at the risk of uh, disagreeing with uh, Vitaly, Sahel is certainly one of the target areas of the ISIS. The battle between the ISIS and the Taliban will take time to resolve in any one way or the other. But I think people in the Sahel, governments in the Sahel, need to be careful as to what is taking place. Before we get um, another group of Al-Shabaab and other and Boko Harams coming up in the place, I just want to mention this because I come from with an intelligence background. I, I have a fair amount of intelligence still coming my way. I think it's important to keep a, uh, a careful watch on the Sahel by the, by the governments there and by other international agencies capable of doing so. I just thought I would intervene on that. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. So, Mr. Alzabi, go ahead. Yes, um, I, th I think we need to be aware also of another factor when we talk about Sahel nowadays. It is polarization. You know, uh, we don't want superpower fighting. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the area. Uh, they have the same cause, but unfortunately, they might have uh, interest. Thank you. And to round up the first line of question, Renault, we talked about the EU common approach. The ambassador was saying perhaps with the incoming new German government, there might be a new impetus. What are your thoughts? Uh, you, the microphone, I think. The hand microphone seems. Je vais simplement d'abord répondre à Madame le Ministre. Euh, je pense que l'erreur ici euh, des démocraties occidentales, c'est qu'il faut surtout éviter de retomber dans le piège colonial. Très clairement, la France et d'autres puissances, l'Angleterre avant elle, etc., ont décidé, la France par exemple, en 1960, qu'elle n'avait plus à administrer la partie de l'Afrique qu'elle contrôlait, que c'était les Africains qui allaient s'administrer eux-mêmes. Dans le sans-frontiérisme et dans le néoconservatisme, il faut voir que c'est la pulsion coloniale qui revient par la fenêtre, mais sans la volonté d'y mettre les moyens moraux, humains, matériels, euh, de faire les choses jusqu'au bout. C'est exactement ce qui s'est passé en Mésopotamie, où les Américains ont été lassés, n'ont pas fait les choses jusqu'au bout. Je ne suis pas sûr que la démocratie irakienne marche parfaitement, aussi bien que nous l'avait annoncé W. Bush. Même chose pour l'Afghanistan et même chose pour cette malheureuse Libye où la France a commis sans doute la plus grave erreur de politique étrangère de toute la Ve République à avoir renversé le régime en place pour le remplacer euh, par euh, de l'anarchie et même par une forme de, euh, de guerre civile. Donc, en fait, euh, le problème, c'est que dans ces interventions-là, il ne faut pas se, se faire prendre dans le piège colonial, c'est-à-dire qu'au Mali, par exemple, beaucoup, euh, et j'y suis allé, euh, beaucoup de Maliens disent « Ah, ben voilà, les Français sont revenus, c'est eux qui vont administrer le pays ». Et si c'est mal administré, eh bien on fait des manifestations contre, contre les Français. Non, on ne peut pas... On peut aider des, des pays à leur demande sur un, un problème très, très spécifique, mais il ne faut surtout pas se laisser, entrer, se laisser prendre par le piège colonial, car nous n'avons plus ni la volonté, ni même les moyens matériels et moraux de faire du nation building, de la colonisation euh, à la Jules Ferry, nous n'avons plus ces moyens. Et c'est le problème que nous avons eu au Mali, c'est que nous avons privilégié la solution militaire sans voir que le régime d'Ibeka, que, 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 que les, les institutions politiques maliennes étaient complètement pourries, que donc on allait 
arrivé à rien. Maintenant, je suis tout à fait d'accord euh, pour ne pas euh, pré précipiter un retour. On y est. Il faut faire très attention dans la manière où euh, nous euh, repartirons du Sahel. Alors, en ce qui concerne euh, une politique, euh, la question, c'est... Uh, the question is... Uh, the what... question about a, a, EU, a unified EU approach uh, to Afghanistan, about recognizing the Taliban and, and uh, you know, going ahead now that the new German government has been elected after Merkel, is there going to be some impetus? Do you foresee... You said it's wishful thinking for the EU to have a common approach, but I think the ambassador was asking if you see some changes ahead. No, I don't think that the new uh, Mr. Scholz uh, um, will, uh, is very interested in, the, um, uh, in Afghanistan. The um, German presence in Kunduz were not, was not very successful. The German soldiers never really fought. Uh, there was even, they refused one, one time to, f to fight even to protect their own citizens. I mean, right. there was an incident, um, I'm not going... So, Afghanistan didn't yeah. leave a very good memory in Germany. I don't think that you will have any interest of uh, Germany uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. I think you, will ha you can have a um, unified uh, cooperation uh, policy of European Union, he help, humanity will help, I mean, food help and so on to Afghanistan. I think right. you will have uh, no more um, and um, of course France was concerned because France had, you know, all ties with Afghanistan, so there was some kind of... Uh, right. Um, uh, and, 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 and maybe, you know, it's why I think that embassy should be kept. Maybe we need an embassy to remind to the Taliban what agreement they signed in Doha. I mean, you have somebody to remind them. So it's why I think that it's useful to have a, a, an embassy open in Kabul. It doesn't mean at all that we, 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 we share the values no. of the Taliban because we do not share them. We think like, like our host, the Emirates, we think that no. politics and religion should be separated totally. Right. All right, and Renault here in Abu Dhabi has already declared Olaf Scholz the new German Chancellor. Right? <laughs> so, so breaking news, uh, breaking news out of the World Policy Conference. It's been decided. Um, uh, time is mercilessly, Tatiana, before we round it up, I'm going to go for a second round of questions. One sentence be before we go. Voilà, just, just peut-être uh, un, un mot. Est-ce que, par exemple, la coopération entre la Russie et les États-Unis est encore possible Je vois en tout cas un signe positif. Au mois de septembre, il y a eu la rencontre entre le chef de l'état-major Gerasimov et le général Mark Mullet à Helsinki. Donc, il y a en tout cas peut-être quelque chose aussi qui va continuer d'une manière pragmatique en dehors de l'idéologie et de la politique. Je, euh, sur, sur le Sahel, juste un mot euh, pour la Russie, le retour dans le Sahel, dans le Mali, évidemment, on suit tous euh, l'activité avec les euh, Wagner et euh, les accords qui ont été passés. Euh, C'est aussi débattu, cette question, mais à très long terme, dans la communauté d'expertise russe, verra-t-on un jour les Wagner russes euh, en Afghanistan, comme euh, il est hors de question que les troupes régulières puissent euh, y être présentes La question ne se pose pas pour l'instant, mais euh, en sachant, euh, en connaissant les, les richesses aussi des sols euh, afghans, euh, lithium, les terres rares, etc., ce n'est pas quelque chose qui est complètement exclu. Et dernier point, je regrette juste qu'on n'a pas eu le temps de parler un petit peu plus des, de l'attitude des pays euh, de l'Asie centrale à l'égard. C'est vraiment les pays Indeed. limitrophes, les premiers concernés. Indeed. Et euh, il y a des choses à dire parce que ces attitudes sont extrêmement variées, qui vont d'une posture très dure du Tadjikistan, qui est le seul pays de l'Asie centrale qui refuse à discuter avec les Afghanistans, et à l'attitude beaucoup plus souple de l'Ouzbékistan, par exemple. Final round of questions. I know we are running out of time mercilessly. Let's, let's go here. Se second row, the gentleman has been having his hand up for quite some time. Um, and, and I can already tell we're not going to be able to include all questions. So my apologies from here on. From where I'm sitting, you can't see it. We already have, have exhausted our time. But, but I think the discussion is so riveting. Thierry will excuse if we go 10 minutes long. Go ahead. 
Okay, uh, thanks for a great debate. I think I enjoyed it and that was very challenging and that was thought provoking. A uh, couple of remarks, question if you will. Uh, on the question of what happened in the past, four administrations bear some sort of responsibility for what happened in Afghanistan. And two of them were Democrats and two of them were Republicans. There's a majority of American people now for sure who wants to get out of Afghanistan. If there is a referendum, which will not happen, but we have polls, majority, over 60% of the American people wants to get out of Afghanistan right. for quite some time. Right. Now, the reality is that there was a plan started by the Trump administration. There was negotiation in Doha. The negotiations in Doha were never concluded. The second phase of the negotiations was supposed to include participation from the Afghan government. And one of the preconditions was, as you well know, the U.S. has to satisfy itself that there would be no threat to, from Afghanistan towards the rest of the world. Right. These two preconditions were never fulfilled. If you remember, a meeting was supposed to take place in Camp David, never took place because it was canceled at the last minute. Now, on the argument between Jim and right. Renault on the betrayal. What I will say is that if both administrations, Republican and Democrat, bear full responsibility for the war, the Biden administration will bear full responsibility for the way it was done. Because Biden keeps saying, I was right, we have to get out of Afghanistan. There are ways and means of getting out of Afghanistan. I'm not going to argue about the 2,500, the argument right. of the general in front of right. Congress. This is, I'm not competent enough to have a view right. on that. The only thing I can say for sure is that when you have an administration that runs on a program that I will going to talk to our allies and take a decision as important as this one without any consultation, any consultation whatsoever on the timing, on the logistic, and finally end up in a situation where a lot of people were able to leave Afghanistan, but they were able to leave Afghanistan largely because of private initiative right. and not because of the support of the state administration. Right. Gentlemen, can we have the question? The la well. <laughs> we, are, we are running out of time. I'm sorry. Do you have a question? My question is, do you believe after what happened in Afghanistan that you can trust the Biden administration to support Taiwan? All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Please pass on the mic to, to the lady right behind him. He's been having his hand up. Please make it a short question. Yes, it's a short remark followed by a question. My remark is one on what Renault and Jim said about the expression nation building. And I don't think there was serious nation building in Afghanistan. I've been to Afghanistan in 2003 and there was like huge plans about irrigation system. It never materialized. I think the development dimension was very minimal compared to the militarized approach. And I want to ask them, uh, when you have a guerrilla, how can you fight them? I mean, when they're enmeshed, enmeshed in the population, you go to a village and you tell them whoever is Taliban, raise his hand. The only way to fight them is to dry out the social incubator and through development, and it never happened. Right. So what do you think about that? Right, uh, thank you. Uh, just a second, I'm gonna come to you. La last question, because we've been running off time. The lady in the back has been having her hand up uh, for quite some time. Uh, apologies, uh, I already see. Uh, we, we, could do, we could do another panel right after lunch on, uh, on Afghanistan, I take it, but unfortunately we have to wrap it up. Your question, please, ma'am. Merci beaucoup, uh, Christine de Souche. Uh, je voulais uh, revenir sur uh, la question d'avoir associé les, les problématiques Afghanistan et Sahel et en dire que pour moi c'était très pertinent, et notamment la question qui avait été reposée uh, tout à l'heure par ma ministre uh, Touré, uh, de savoir effectivement si... Uh, euh, le retour des talibans euh, pouvait être considéré comme un élément important euh, pour l'avenir de la problématique euh, de la lutte contre le terrorisme au Sahel. Et je pense que s'il n'y a pas, comme l'a dit Marc aussi, euh, de réponse à donner, parce qu'on ne sait pas quelle va être la politique exacte des, euh, des talibans à l'égard de, 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 du terrorisme, je pense qu'effectivement c'est une question fondamentale. Et à ce titre-là, je pense qu'il y aura pour les prochaines sessions des réflexions à mener. En revanche, sur le contexte, je pense que c'est totalement différent. Euh, contrairement à ce qui a pu être dit tout à l'heure, euh, la situation justement au Sahel, notamment en ce qui concerne la problématique de l'imposition de la démocratie, 
ne se posent absolument pas dans les mêmes conditions en Afghanistan et euh, au Sahel. En particulier, je rappelle que le Mali, comme bien d'autres pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest, ont une tradition non seulement démocratique, mais également ont été parmi ceux qui ont fait, j'allais dire, revenir la, la, la right. réflexion sur la démocratie. Je m'arrête là, donc... Euh, euh, il y a effectivement, je Lamy. pense, un contexte très différent euh, qu'il sera là aussi utile de, de continuer à examiner. Merci. Thank you so much. The, the Sark question, I'm going to come to you, Mark. Uh, some of those questions are uh, made for you, it seems. But, but this is an opportunity for us to wrap up the session, so everybody is going to get their turn. Jim, let me start with the question on, again, we talked about the credibility, perhaps the, the, the tarnished repu uh, credibility of the United States with the hastened. Um, is this an example? Is this also a message to China, perhaps, from now on? It's a, it's a major problem. I think that's a major problem for the U.S., and I think that's the major takeaway that the U.S. is going to, Washington is going to feel, is that uh, credibility is going to be in question everywhere. And the question about Taiwan is interesting. Um, whether uh, the Chinese will believe that uh, all the presence out there of uh, American military ships mean anything or not. Um, just to say that, um, that it was actually the Trump administration that said that uh, they were going to pull out by May 1st, which was much before the um, Biden administration. I know we're on diff diff different sides of the political equation, Jean-Claude, so I know that. <laughs> but in any case, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, I'd go back to what the, uh, just to summarize, I'd go back to what the general said. It. Yes. They, they said, that they said uh, the pull out of Afghanistan was a tactical success, but a, but a strategic failure. A tactical success because we evacuated the second largest civilian population in history. 124,000 people were evacuated in space for a few days. Only 6,000 of them were Americans, which means to say 118,000 of those evacuated were Afghans, were uh, other nationalities uh, that had people that were helping them in Iran and you know, Afghanistan and et cetera. Um, and uh, uh, of course, a strategic failure because of exactly what you say is that this has left uh, the US in a very, uh, I would say, fragile condition in terms of its credibility uh, around the world. Mark, some of the questions uh, about terrorism, about guerrilla warfare, <laughs> about, uh, go ahead. Yeah, if you, uh, figure out one thousand uh, dollars spent in the war on terror. Actually, there were nine hundred uh, on military operations, and let's say one hundred approximately on other aspects, especially development. Uh, so, development was actually included in the strategy. Uh, it was very important in the counterinsurgency strategy uh, that was designed by the U.S. Armed Forces in two thousand and six. Uh, the problem is that development was badly done. And actually, there were uh, two main flows. The first one uh, was that uh, part of the de development actually went to uh, contractors, uh, and uh, especially Western contractors that were really well paid. And the second problem was corruption. Uh, and uh, I think that corruption is one of the breeding ground and breeding problem of uh, the, the rise of, of terrorism. All right, final remarks. MK Narayanan, I'm going down the down the row and we're ending the way we started, namely with Mr. Al-Azabi. Please go ahead. No, I, I, on the development aspect, I'll say that everybody's talking all, only as if the Americans were on development. We have, India has spent over two billion on, uh, on uh, two billion rupees, not dollars, okay, basically on uh, hydroelectric projects as well as roadways, the Zaran's, the uh, highway, etc. Yes, it, it, they were only small uh, drops, perhaps, but there was, there was development. Many schools were re reopened, particularly if girls' schools were done. So th there has been development project. The failure has been the the, the inability to get, to sort of absorb the uh, attitude of what the Afghans wanted, and I think that's because we were imposed uh, an American imp imposition of democracy on on a, on a for a country which has never never had democracy. Why you ever went into trying to impose democracy is, is a question that will need to be answered. But the, there, is a, there is a basic issue that we, we need to address. That terrorism is, is, I mean, we have given a fillip to terrorism. And that will be felt particularly in South Asia and West Asia, to a large extent. Maybe they, they, you may not have another attack on, like you had on the Twin Towers and whatnot. But in, in this part of the world, this is going to be a problem for the next generation, if not more. And finally, we never touched on the issue of what is the geopolitical uh, fallout of all. 
all this. I mean, uh, the, the point is that I heard uh, a statement saying, what will China do? I think the Chinese will be wary. They're, of course, careful. They, they know how to extricate themselves quite often from difficult positions. But I think the greed for minerals is go will probably overtake the... the to do that. The, the Russians, for, for, for instance, they have not, they're not shunned the Taliban. The, the Taliban is getting a certain amount of credibility because of some of the, the both China, Russia, and some of the other countries are in, in some kind of contact. So we have to face reality. But the fundamental issue I want to leave, with, please don't see this as a problem to be run by the Americans or the European Union. This is a problem that I think Asia has to uh, own and deal with it. Yes, we will require assistance from from yeah. the rest of the world. Thank right. you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Tatiana, final remarks, two minutes each, uh, because we're getting the sign that uh, lunch is being served. Yeah. Not on the thank stage, you. but in another room. So okay. please. OK, thank you. <laughs> uh, je, je, ce que je constate dans ce que j'ai lu dernièrement dans la littérature stratégique russe, c'est que les Russes travaillent sur quatre scénarios. Marc a dit, on ne sait pas ce qui va devenir. Donc, en tout cas, il euh, y a quatre scénarios qui circulent. Deux que les Russes considèrent comme favorables pour euh, la Russie, d'une manière générale, Talibans forts, mais modérés, qui ne cherchent pas à s'expandre à l'extérieur. Et dans une moindre mesure, Talibans faibles, avec une guerre civile à l'intérieur, ce qui serait catastrophique pour l'Afghanistan, mais ce qui serait confiné euh, au, au pays. Et deux scénarios négatifs, Talibans forts radicaux, avec donc l'intention de, de l'expansion vers l'extérieur, et talibans faibles avec l'effondrement du pays et euh, la guerre de proxy euh, comme en Syrie et en Libye qui dégénère en conflit euh, régional avec l'implication des acteurs internationaux. Et le deuxième point que je voulais souligner, c'est Marc qui me fait penser à ça, je ne pensais pas euh, citer un personnage de la politique intérieure russe euh, qui est Alexei Navalny, mais euh, je vous recommande la tribune qu'il a publiée depuis euh, sa prison dans plusieurs quotidiens internationaux on peut penser euh, ce qu'on veut de son activité euh, en interne. Les structures qui sont liées euh, à sa personnalité ont été déclarées extrémistes. Mais dans cette tribune, il y a justement un point très important concernant la corruption comme l'origine de l'inefficacité de l'action internationale et du mal qui peut générer des problèmes beaucoup plus globaux. Je pense que c'est quelque chose qu'on peut euh, partager et dont on peut discuter En effet, et le cas de l'Afghanistan est très intéressant à étudier de ce point de vue. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Renaud, final remarks. Uh, ma remarque finale, c'est que je pense que cette aventure afghane, qui a été faite, dirigée par un pays qui n'avait pas eu d'expérience coloniale, qui est donc uh, l'Amérique, uh, c'est effectivement la mort de uh, la pulsion coloniale. La pulsion coloniale est généreuse, c'est de dire « je vais émanciper vos femmes, je vais vous apprendre à bien gérer votre pays, je vais vous mettre, euh, mettre la démocratie en Mésopotamie ». C'est euh, généreux. Mais c'est une générosité dangereuse parce qu'en fait, nous, occidentaux, nous n'avons plus les moyens ni financiers, ni surtout moraux, euh, ni humains. C'est-à-dire qu'en en fait, euh, les officiers coloniaux français ou britanniques, quand ils partaient en Mauritanie, ils restaient quatre ans de suite, ils ne revenaient pas. Là, on les fait revenir au bout de trois mois ou de six mois. Comment voulez-vous qu'en Afghanistan, dans ce qui s'appelait les Provention, Provention Reconstruction Teams, comment voulez-vous que les Afghans aient pu se retrouver Parce qu'on changeait les patrons tous les six mois, parce que, parce que nous n'avons plus les moyens humains, nous n'avons plus la volonté de maintenir un capitaine dans le désert pendant deux ans ou trois ans. Et pour répondre à la question sur ce qui n'a pas marché en Afghanistan, les Américains, et Jim a eu raison, ont dépensé des milliards et ont fait des choses en Afghanistan. Ils ont fait un réseau routier remarquable. Ils ont mis le téléphone portable partout. C'était très utile pour les talibans, d'ailleurs, d'avoir le téléphone portable. Ils ont mis le téléphone portable partout. Donc ils ont fait des choses, des, des infrastructures. Mais je vais vous, juste vous raconter une anecdote qui va vous faire comprendre que, pourquoi ça n'a pas marché. J'étais avec les troupes de l'OTAN à Kandahar, c'était des Canadiens, et ils construisaient une route. À la pause des ouvriers, avec mon interprète, je suis allé prendre le thé avec les ouvriers. Et j'ai demandé qui étaient des Afghans. Je leur ai demandé... Qu'est-ce que vous pensez des Canadiens 
Ils m'ont dit, ah, c'est formidable, ces gens-là sont généreux. Euh, ils nous construisent une route alors que ce n'est pas leur intérêt. Et puis, ils ont recruté du personnel local, c'est formidable, nous-mêmes. Et puis, ils nous payent beaucoup mieux que, que d'autres employeurs pourraient nous payer. Donc, les Canadiens, l'OTAN, formidable, bravo. Et je leur ai demandé, et qu'est-ce que vous pensez du Mola Omar Ah, oh, mais c'est un saint homme, le Mola Omar. C'est un homme, c'est un saint, quoi, c'est un saint. Euh... Ah oui Et euh, qu'est-ce que vous pensez des talibans Ah ben, les talibans, ils sont très utiles. Parce que lorsque nous avons un différent judiciaire entre nous sur une question de terrain, évidemment, on ne va pas chez le juge euh, envoyé par Kaboul, parce que le juge ou la police euh, nous raquette, nous demande de l'argent. Et donc, nous allons vers les gens qui sont pieux et intègres. Donc, nous allons chez les talibans pour avoir la justice. Donc, en fait, dès le début, la chose était pourrie. Et c'est un petit peu le problème que nous avons au Mali, c'est-à-dire que le gouvernement Karzai, au début, était pourri, donc il n'a pas eu le soutien, un vrai soutien de la population, et c'est pour ça que son, ar son armée s'est effondrée right. comme cela, sinon elle ne se serait pas effondrée comme cela. Yeah. Il n'y a pas eu vraiment de soutien de la population derrière le gouvernement Karzai ou le gouvernement d'Ashraf Ghani. Thank you so much, uh, Renault. To take it away, Mr. Alzabi, now you're going to sum up everything we've said. No, of course not. <laughs> we, 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 your final remarks uh, uh, for us to take away. Um, it's really two parts. Uh, I need just to answer a little bit of the question. Of when course. you talk about nation building, I don't think you can build a nation without having a security. So since the, the 2002, really, the mission has changed from uh, you know, attacking or, or eliminating the, the uh, uh, terrorist group, Al-Qaeda at that time, to uh, assisting and providing security and, and also uh, capability building. So we need to admit that, uh, I'm not saying that, um, I mean, we managed to train uh, 300,000. Unfortunately, what happened la later on is, is something uh, we can discuss. But I think uh, nation building, it has to have a security foundation, and that was the military what uh, they were doing. Uh, uh, really, now we are having like um, 46 days since the fall of Kabul, I think. Uh, it's, uh, in history, this is a very short uh, period, so I think uh, we need to uh, observe for a while, but also we need to keep engaging. Uh, keep, yeah, keep engaging with the government and with the people. Uh, no doubt. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this wraps up this very crucial session on Afghanistan. But I think it's become abundantly clear, and I think I speak for all here in the audience who've been here throughout the previous 90 minutes. This has been a very intricate, multi-layered, uh, very thoughtful discussion about one of the most complex, intricate issues of our time. And I think this panel in, it is, in and of itself has shown how much work still lays ahead, uh, how complex this issue is. We were perhaps in these 90 minutes only were able to touch upon the surface, but a very, very valuable surface uh, that is. Thank you for your uh, attention, your, your patience. Th apologies to those whom due to time constraints I was not able to call upon, but I think we are all deserving after this uh, very heavy discussion. A round of applause for our lovely panelists. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.